Well, thank you, and I, I feel very privileged to be here. This is, uh, and, and to be able to share with you and to get your feedback on uh, some of the concerns that I, that I raise in, in, uh, in my book. I think this center is a very, very special place, and I'm, I'm very happy to be here. The, the starting point of my book is the conundrum that, although we all know how important food is, somehow we've landed ourselves with a global food system that generates hunger alongside of obesity, land grabs, climate change, threats to health. And somehow public responsibility has been sold out to markets and corporations while the frontline actors of food security, families, communities, small scale producers have been disempowered. So my book tries to take a look at how this has happened and what we might be able to do about it. And um, it's based above all on my own experience, as Michelle hinted at in, in, I hate to say this, but four decades in the food world on the interface between African villages and UN meeting halls, and my, my efforts to make sense out of what I was seeing, uh, which have led me progressively to ask questions that have to do with power. Who wields it? To what effect? Uh, to whose benefit? Who is it that frames the food agenda? Who establishes the facts of the situation? Who weighs in when decisions about food are being taken? And what possibilities we have of addressing power imbalances and giving more voice to, in fact, the majority of the world's population who are among the food insecure for one reason or another? What prospects are there to defend common interests and collective public goods for today and tomorrow. So I'd like to start with just a, a few dates in the post-war history of international food security governance. 1944, FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization, was established to fight hunger. But the basic measures that the first Director General, Lord Boyd Orr, advocated to be able to privilege people's needs over uh, commodity traders' profits were uh, opposed by Britain and the UK in particular. The food crisis in the mid-70s motivated the convening of a World Food Conference, which, however, continued to avoid the real issues, the need to establish global food reserves, to regulate agricultural trade in the name of food security. 1989, the term Washington Consensus is coined, which, as I'm sure you know, is shorthand for the package of neoliberal structural adjustment policies imposed on developing countries, opening up their markets, deregulation, reducing state support to agriculture. 1995, the World Trade Organization comes along and gives a further push towards opening developing countries' markets and promoting corporate concentration along the food system. By 2005, the system is starting to creak. The WTO grinds to a halt in Hong Kong on the agriculture package. 2007, 2008, the food price crisis. And 2009, the reform of the Committee on World Food Security that we'll be spending some time on to see whether this might be something different. But in the meantime, let's just draw a couple of lessons from this brief historical uh, uh, excursion. Uh, the first is that the same problems are still with us. Food is more than a commodity, was Lord Boyd Orr's parting thrust when he resigned in frustration from FAO in 1948. And it's a slogan of the food sovereignty movement today. And what has been missing consistently has been political commitment to long-term public collective goals as opposed to short-term particular national or private interests. So uh, a reaction of outrage is understandable, but it's insufficient. We need to be able to read beneath the service and understand what the interests are at play. And uh, food regime analysis can help us here because it takes a, a big picture political economy look at how world capitalism has organized agricultures in order to enhance commercial profits throughout different phases in which different actors have played the central uh, organizing role, the British Empire, then the US in the post-World War II period, handing over to the um, 
uh, the uh, agribusiness corporations. But these regimes, whoever is leading them, do not come along by chance. They're, they emerge out of contexts between these powerful political and economic actors and social movements, workers, farmers, whereby some kind of equilibrium between profits and welfare is established that allows the system to move forward. And the rules by which these regimes operate seem to be natural, just the way things are, free trade, until the equilibrium starts to break down. And we're in a moment now when the equilibrium is breaking down and questions can and should be asked about the rules of the game that have facilitated an astounding concentration of the power of transnational agri-food corporations over the past two decades. As I'm sure you know, the five largest traders in grain control 75% of international trade. In the multinational seed industry, the top three countries, uh, co companies alone claim almost 50% of the global proprietary seed market that they're allowed to patent under intellectual property rights that I'm sure you all know everything about that reward corporations for the resources that they re invest in laboratory research but ignore the far more substantial efforts of millions and millions of anonymous farmers in their fields and the need to guarantee their rights to use and exchange their own seeds. Retail markets are now the most powerful component of the corporate food system. Supermarket chains have moved into the global south, aided by global policies that have opened up these economies to unregulated foreign investment. Just let me give you one figure to give you a kind of an idea of the dimensions we're talking about. The number of Walmarts in Mexico has risen from 14 in 1944 to guess how many in 2012? Who wants to throw a, a fee? Huh? 200. Any other ideas? 1,724. And you can imagine, <laughs> well, you see, this is, this is the dimensions we're talking about. And you can imagine what the impacts have been on small scale producers, but also on small scale traders. So corporations exercise their power and their influence over the food system, not only by their sheer size and their capacity to set prices, as you can imagine, when you, when you, when you, hold, when, when you control that much of the market, you're the ones who set the prices, but also, particularly perniciously, by the increasingly important role that they've come to play in the regulation of the food system through the rise of private standards and the decline of the state's regulatory role. And finally, the agri-food businesses expend enormous amounts of money in seeking to influence consumer choices and public opinion to their benefit. These two examples are from the US, but I'm sure you could throw at me a number of uh, British examples. Um, the one on the left is the amount of money that was invested by corporations to influence a, uh, a referendum in California that was trying to obtain the right of consumers to know whether or not there are GMOs in the, in the foods that they purchase. And uh, the second, the right-hand the right side of the slide uh, illustrates the extremely important issue we're in an academic setting here of corporation-friendly corporation funding sources on quote-unquote scientific evidence. Uh, the grants uh, to Harvard University by the Gates Foundation have produced such products as this passionate plea in favor of biotechnology as a solution to hunger in Africa. Another class of actors has entered into the globalized food system more recently, speculative financial capital, which uh, abstracts food and land from its physical forms and from their value use into highly complex derivatives that are hard to understand for all but the most expert. Uh, 
So this, of course, makes it very difficult to make any link between cause and effect and to assign accountability. And it has been demonstrated that this kind of speculation has negative impacts in terms of provoking land grabbing and food price volatility. The corporate-led food regime relies on a global market organized in a way that favors its operations. It's estimated, uh, guess what percent of, uh, of all food produced in the world transits through the global market? Who wants to throw out a percentage? 30. Another? 12 percent. Most food is consumed in the country or the region in which it's produced, yet the impacts of the way the global market is organized and the speculation it permits are visited on the local food systems of countries whose share in the world market is minimal, but have been sucked into it through structural adjustment and trade regulations. And this is true above all for Africa, not only, but above all for Africa. So if you ask the question, who benefits from global free trade, and the question, who benefits, is a question you have to ask always. You have three uh, voices up here on the, on the slide. The only voice that maintains it's a win-win-win paradise is the agribusiness corporations here in the form of global harvest, while FAO documents the fact that the winners are the rich, and the losers are, guess who? The poor. So what impact does the corporate global food regime have on small-scale food producers? Clearly, the global food chains are intimately linked to an industrialized model of agriculture production because of their logic, their scale, and the economic interests that drive them. One result is the expulsion of many small-scale producers to make room for, corporate, for plantations. An alternative is contract farming for small-scale producers to be linked into uh, corporate-led value chains through contra contract farming, which sounds better because at least the farmers are left on the land, but it's not that much better because they're the ones who shoulder the climatic risks and all of the other multitude of risks that agriculture, uh, that are an integral part of agriculture, while at the same time, they're subjected to corporate control over what they plant, when, how, and the prices they receive. So the small-scale producers lose the resilience, that's one of your key words, I know, which is the very basis of, uh, they, they lose the autonomy that's the basis of their resilience because they're no longer free to make decisions about what they plant and when, to have fields that are uh, a mixture of various things. They have to plant what the corporations tell them and this has an extremely negative impact on their resilience. And then corporate value chains have a funny way of rewarding everyone else more than the primary producers, as you can see in the case of the cocoa chain here. Yet, the corporate narrative assumes that the future for small-scale family farmers lies in linking up with the industrial food chains for those few who can manage to do so, the more privileged ones, the better resourced ones, and becoming advanced farmers, you see up there in the right hand uh, corner. Uh, while the rest will be migrated out of agriculture in the elegant formulation of the Syngenta Foundation who produced this graph. Where to? That's somebody else's problem, not the corporations. So what do those directly involved think about this narrative? Let's shift to listen to the small-scale food producers and peasant movements who as you know well, are not an archaic minority, but um, how about another figure? Who wants to throw out a figure for the number of family farmers, pastoralists, artisanal fisher folk, indigenous peoples, urban farmers? How many people are we talking about? 
3 billion, 3 billion. I mean, we're talking about still close to half of the world's population. And what's more, they produce most of the food in the world. And um, they have not been taking these developments lying down. World people have been organizing around the world, particularly over the past two decades, in reaction to the impacts of the neoliberal policies and the corporate concentration that we've just reviewed, starting at the local level and building up. And the need to reach the global level became increasingly evident with the advent of the WTO in 1995. It became clear that decisions were being taken at the global level that impacted on the livelihoods, the possibilities of continuing to produce and to reproduce their families of family farmers around the world. And in fact, the uh, largest and best known global peasant network, La Via Campesina. Do you, are you all familiar with La Via Campesina? Everybody? Nobody? Everybody? <laughs> Saw the light in 1993, and, and the fact that the WTO was on the screen was about to come into, uh, into the limelight was, was uh, very much a part of the decision to build up um, organization to that level. The World Food Summits, called by FAO in 1996 and 2002, and above all, the parallel civil society forums uh, provided a strong impetus for the global networking of these rural movements, due in good part, and this is important to remember, the things that make a difference. And we were just talking, Michelle and myself, about the right people at the right time doing the right things. You know, it's a question of, opportunity and how you seize it. So there was a, a deliberate political choice on the part of the organizers of the civil society forums to put rural social movements in the majority and in the decision-making position in terms of developing the positions that civil society would take to the official summits. And uh, as I'm sure you're, uh, you're aware, in most UN processes and summits, it's NGOs that dominate, not social movements. And I just want to recall to you the important distinction that exists within this, this heterogeneous basket of civil society between uh, NGOs and people's organizations. The NGOs uh, provide often useful services for disadvantaged sectors of the population, they advocate on issues that affect them, but they do not represent them. They're not accountable to them. Whereas people's organizations are established by these sectors themselves, they're mandated to speak for them, and they're accountable to them. So it makes a lot of difference in terms of legitimacy and who has the right to speak for whom. Is that clear to everybody, this distinction? Because it's an important one. The movements also, uh, ah, the movements uh, have progressively developed their own alternative paradigm to green revolution technology and free trade. I think everyone here knows food about food sovereignty. No, I, I don't think I have to. In in this public, I don't need to illustrate the <laughs> this particular slide. You all know uh, what it is, the the main principle, and and these uh, uh, the the ideas that I've summarized on this slide. And they also established a network to carry forward their engagement with global institutions, the International Planning Committee for Food Sovereignty. You can imagine how uh, difficult or impossible it would be for an individual artisanal fisher folk organization in Thailand or a peasant organization in Mali to uh, engage directly with what Michel called the, the FAO bureaucrats. <laughs> and the governments, of course. So it was absolutely indispensable for them to have a facilitating network that belonged to them. And the, the IPC does belong to the rural movements. They're the ones who run the show and who make the decisions. And over the past decade, uh, since 2003, the IPC has opened up significant political space for these rural movements 
in global FAO forums where they'd never set foot before. It had always been only the governments and some NGOs like Oxfam, the big NGOs who were interested in food issues. But it just had never happened that the organizations representing those most directly concerned by the policy decisions that were being taken were in the room being able to uh, see and witness what was happening. So the IPC opened up this room, this space for them and coached them in how to occupy it effectively because it's not enough to be there if you don't know what to say, when to say it uh, and how to, how to carry forward your advocacy. So let's look at what they're proposing as against the global corporate food system, remembering of course as you guys know very well that it's not an opposition between North and South but between two quite different approaches to food provisioning that oppose each other here in the North and in the Global South as well. The term local in local food webs can mean different things in different contexts of course from within a day's walk of the village to uh, national or regional as opposed to global. But in any event, in all cases, it underlines the dimension of control by the people of a given territory over a series of factors that globalization tends to remove beyond their control. Whereas the term web is a beautiful contrast with the term chain and it uh, emphasizes the interconnectedness of the different actors in a food provisioning system at the local level. In the Global North, as you know well, initiatives to reconnect consumers to sources of healthy food are proliferating. I see in front of me someone who's working on that in, uh, in Coventry. <laughs> um, and in the Global South, the dominance of small-scale family farming and local food webs is simply overwhelming. Family farms produce over 70% of Brazil's food supplies on much less land than the quote-unquote modern agribusinesses occupy. And in Africa, family farms constitute 80% of all farms in the continent and meet up to 80% of the food needs. Worldwide, it's estimated that what we could call the peasant food web produces some 70% of the total food eaten by people, and yet the support they receive from the public sector is minimal. And this is one of the political issues. Building blocks of food systems that are alternative to the corporate system, essentially the pillars of the food sovereignty agenda, are being put in place locally throughout the world. People are fighting to defend their access to and control over um, natural resources, not only through protest, but also through concrete action. For example, as the lady in the middle of the, of the, the slide, to save and multiply threatened native seeds. Agroecological models of production are finally gaining recognition. In 2004, the very few FAO experts who were interested in agroecology had to practically congregate in the corridors and whisper they were so much against the mainstream thoughts. And 10 years later, last September, a uh, an astounding two-day uh, seminar symposium on uh, agroecology was organized and the director general stated uh, today a window was opened in what for 50 years has been the cathedral of the green revolution and I cite this example just to recall particularly to the younger people in this room that change can happen it takes time, it takes a lot of effort, but it can happen, and this is just one of, of many examples. Markets are perhaps the toughest area of all because of the domination of a single idea of the market. But in fact, of course, the world is full of markets that decentralize the encounter between supply and demand, 
and that, equally important, respond to criteria other than profit alone. Another extremely important pillar of the food sovereignty agenda is um, approaches to research and the generation of knowledge that build on and enhance local knowledge. And I know that's one of the things this center is particularly interested in. In my book, I look briefly at how the two contrasting food systems impact on major global challenges like maintaining dwindling, dwindling biodiversity. We've had the recent case of GMOs uh, contaminating land race maize in Mexico or protecting the health of the world's population. As I'm sure you know, more people globally suffer from overweight and obesity than from hunger. Combating food waste, addressing climate change. Again, I'm sure you know that the industrial food system is responsible for some 50% of all global greenhouse gas emissions. So when you add all of this up, there's no doubt as to which approach to food provisioning scores best. And in fact, I haven't worked out the arithmetics on this, but I'm sure it's true that if the corporate food regime was obliged to reflect in the prices of its product, the cost of their negative environmental, social, and political externalities, they would be much more expensive than the products of small-scale agroecological producers selling on local markets. Now, the fallback argument for supporters of the global food, corporate food system is that whether we like it or not, only industrial agriculture can double food production by 2050 to feed the world's growing population. I'm sure you've all heard this multiple times. But in fact, this thesis rests on several questionable assumptions. Does anyone want to take an attempt at flinging out a, a questionable assumption behind this, uh, this truism, apparent truism? Rates of population growth will remain stable. Exactly, that's the first one, which, uh, which uh, ignores the fact that the average family size worldwide uh, has uh, been reduced, has been uh, uh, practically uh, dropped by half over the past four decades and will drop more the more women are empowered. So we can choose between investing in chemical inputs or in women's empowerment and we'll get the same effect. And the second is that we need to double food production. On the contrary, there's overwhelming evidence that the present food supply is adequate and will be tomorrow the problem is one of unequal and inequitable access to food, and the solution obviously is political. It's not technical fixing with uh, fiddling with production. And finally, the, the corporate narrative assumes that industrial high-tech agriculture is indeed significantly more productive than agroecological family farming, and I'm sure this center is actively engaged in disproving this, uh, uh, a research a study uh, published by uh, University of California Berkeley researchers just last December has done a good job of just the latest in a series of, of rebuttals. So in conclusion, it's the smiling woman in the center of the slide who has the answer, not the doer gentleman around the margins. Alternative building is grounded in local situations, but is progressively reaching outward, building alliances and networking, not only upwards, but also horizontally among food-centered people's initiatives in different sectors of society, producers and consumers, for example, and in different countries. And with local authorities, Alternative food governance is building up from the community level in the form, for example, of local food policy councils, citizens taking food provision back into their hands. I think this is something that's spreading in the UK these days, no? 
it, it got going in North America, but I, I, I understand that, that this, this kind of uh, decentralized look at, at uh, what kind of policies need to be put in place at the level of a, of a municipality is something that uh, is also taking root in, uh, uh, in the UK. And um, uh, national uh, policies can also empower people, of course. H how many of you know about the uh, Zero Hunger Program of Brazil? Is that common knowledge to you? No? Isn't that where they really help these people, or, or is it also can be sure that they have access to land? It's more the first um, it's, it's, it has to do with, well, it, it's quite a complex program and has a number of different aspects to it. Uh, but uh, one, of the, um, one of the most important is uh, provisioning, purchasing food from local family farmers for a whole series of, uh, of uh, public sector programs like school feeding, hospital feeding, and for social protection schemes. There's a thing called the Bolsa Familiare, the uh, family, uh, family funds whereby, whereby uh, poor families are, are uh, their access to food is, is, is enhanced. And the source of this food is obligatory local family farming. So this is, you know, it, it's a, it's a, it's a real win-win situation. And this kind of approach of, of, uh, of public provisioning of food is something that's spreading in, in Italy as well. And in fact, there's going to be a meeting on it uh, in FAO in June, trying to bring together the, the, uh, the experience that exists. India is another country where there's an important uh, public provisioning program underway. So this kind of, these kinds of policies at the, not the global level, but beneath can be extremely enabling and empowering for uh, the food sovereignty uh, agenda. So this rapid review is intended simply as a reminder that concrete action is underway around the world to build more equitable and sustainable territorially rooted food systems. And therefore, supportive changes in paradigms and regulations and resource allocation at the global level could make a difference. A uh, very uh, important uh, and authoritative report that was published by the Committee on World Food Security a couple of years ago underlined the fact that transformations in agriculture are not inevitable. They're the result of explicit or implicit political choices. And you're not going to get good policies without transparent political processes that involve smallholder organizations. So there's an issue of who decides. And also on what basis the decisions are taken. The ancient Greeks called on oracles to complement philosophical reasoning. And apparently they often did a pretty good job. But contemporary decision makers instead consider that they can count on scientific information and statistical data to provide them with objective grounds for what is known as evidence-based policy. To what degree do you think this, uh, this is uh, a ground, a founded assumption? What, what is your sense of, uh, of how evidence-based, the evidence-based policies are? Exactly, exactly, exactly. In fact, um, evidence is framed by the paradigms that are adopted, which condition the assumptions that we make. Now take a look at this, um, this excerpt from uh, Truman's famous Point Four inaugural address of 1949. And just tell me, pick out a, an assumption or two. Exactly, that's one. And there's another 
Oh, that's another. In fact, there are, it's, it's full of assumptions, exactly. Well, the role of science and technology, obviously, is the key lens. Exactly, exactly. And, in fact, productivism is uh, alive and well today. This is, what, seven decades later? And it underlines today the discourse that supports the corporate regime. It, it has a quite, quite a long pedigree as a, as a paradigm. It's associated with modernization, with the idea of linear progress from what, we're, what are assumed to be primitive rural agrarian societies to advanced urban industrialized societies. And we all know how happy you are to be in the countryside rather than in Coventry. And it privileges Western science and technology. Uh, just one of the ways it does so, just to, to give you an idea of how this works out in practice, is by um, adopting measures of how do, how do you measure production? You know, even it could be quite justified to measure production, but how you measure it makes an enormous difference. If you measure it, by looking at yield per plant, and I know there are people in this room that know more about this than I do, you're going to end up uh, glorifying external inputs, more you know, fertilizer and things that can, that can take the plant, a plant, as the unit and get it to produce more ears of maize or whatever. Whereas if you, you're interested in measuring the total environmental and social benefits, then you're going to look at the total yield per diversified uh, field, as in the optic of agroecology, rather than what one single plant that's been pumped with inputs can, uh, can produce. So even if you are interested in measuring production, there are different ways of going about it. And of course, the productivist discourse very conveniently ignores the structural and political causes of hunger and malnutrition. This is a quote from, from Gates himself, uh, in which you will see that uh, productivity is simply cut out, excised from the political, economic, and policy context in which it's situated. So, he's able to get away, or at least he thinks he's getting away, with simplistically assuming that you can promote uh, productivity by providing farmers with, quote unquote, the right seeds and information, which of course are things that corporations do a very good job of, um, without concern for the multiple factors that have worked against smallholder production, productivity, and livelihoods for the past decades. Is that, is that clear, the kind of magic that these spin doctors work? If, if people have questions as we go along, do, you know, do come forward for them, because we're going to be covering a lot of terrain. So evidence is shaped by paradigms and hence assumptions that you have in your mind, your mindset, shall we say. But it's also framed by the questions that are asked and by the data that is looked for and is available, a recent study that you can see up here on the slide on sustainable food systems in Africa carried out by regional small-scale food producers organizations themselves that I'm very proud to have been associated with. And one of the first things that they ran up against was the fact that statistics only exist about so-called modern commercial and export markets. There's no information about the informal markets which provide food for most of the people in the region but are not considered to be worthy of research. And we were able to verify this lack of information with FAO's statistical division. They came, the researchers came to Rome and we had a meeting and the FAO statistician said, oh my gosh, you're right, we just you know, don't have this information. Give it to us if you get it, no? So uh, the result of this gap in information collection is that these food markets are invisible. They're not taken into account when policy decisions are being made, despite their obvious importance for food security. So what is billed as objective evidence 
but often isn't, acts against political accountability and against value-based political debate. We end up with, well, that's just the way it is, look at the evidence, rather than we've examined this difficult issue from all sides and this is what we want as a society. And this is the significance of the reform of the Committee on World Food Security. It's the first ever global policy food forum in which small-scale producers are at the table and their evidence has to be listened to. How did it come into being? The food price crisis in late 2007 and 2008 was highlighted by riots of the kind that made governments sit up and take notice in capital cities around the world. And hence, it opened up a window of political opportunity for change that this food sovereignty movement was able to seize because of a decade of networking and capacity building. Otherwise, the opportunity would have been there, but they wouldn't have been in a position to take advantage of it. The crisis, on the one hand, uh, revealed the deficiencies of dominant wisdom, dominant policies and approaches, which had, for example, transformed Africa from a net food exporter into a net, net food importer in the space of a decade, as shown in this FAO graph by pushing its governments through structural adjustment, uh, et cetera, to export commodities and purchase cheap food, artificially cheap food on the world market, rather than, pro pro uh, rather than producing it domestically. So of course they were left out on a limb when the food prices started to jump around and to increase. The crisis also unveiled a global governance vacuum in the absence of an authoritative and democratic global food security forum, decisions in this important area were being taken by default by institutions like the WTO and the World Bank for whom food security is not their remit, by donor government groups like the G8, and worse still, by, corporate, by economic actors like corporations and financial speculators subject to no political oversight. And the behavior of the latter was uh, the most overtly outrageous. This slide shows the profits that some corporations were making by hoarding their grain stocks during the food price crisis when people were suffering in countries where there wasn't enough food. They hoarded it until the prices shot through the roofs and they made a killing, as uh, a, a publication pointed out. So the international community was obliged to take notice and the range of reactions is really uh, very interesting because it iconically uh, illustrates the ways in which the international community reacts when something like this happens. Uh, on the one hand, Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General of the UN, established a high-level task force grouping the secretariats of 23 UN family agencies that had something to do with food security. They were aiming at better coordination, and fair enough, but with no idea that you needed any kind of political oversight. And that was allied with a, a quite hazy uh, G8-promoted global partnership that highlighted the need for more investment in agriculture, which was also true, but with no discussion about what kind of investment in what kind of agriculture. So among the reactions, the only one that sought policy-led solutions for the causes of the crisis was a proposal for the reform of the existing, but uh, extremely ineffectual at that time, UN Committee on World Food Security. And against all odds, this solution won out thanks to an alliance among uh, some governments, particularly from the Global South, who were sick and tired of having the G8 dictate solutions to their problems, um, FAO, and the social movements who had built up their advocacy capacity to the global level and were able to weigh in effectively. 
This reform uh, took place uh, during 2009. It was an exceptionally inclusive and transparent process. The IPC was able to facilitate participation by rural movements uh, and helped to block attempts by some governments to limit the potential weight of this new forum. And I'll let you guess which governments were interested in limiting the weight, but one of them was mine. So, uh, All of the characteristics that I've put up here on the slide were very hotly debated and strenuously defended by civil society. The fact that the Committee on World Food Security deliberates on food issues from a human rights perspective so adequate food is an unalienable right. It's not just a desirable outcome of a development program. It's a right. The fact that civil society organizations are recognized as full participants, not observers as elsewhere in the UN system. They intervene throughout the debate, not at the end when the governments have already decided everything. And it's not just a once a year affair. They accompany the Intergovernmental Bureau of the CFS throughout the year, helping to decide what's going to be on the agenda, helping to draft uh, discussion papers, etc. The private sector is there as well, but they're a separate constituency. They're not confounded with civil society, as often happens when people say, civil society, that includes everyone from a peasant movement to a corporation. Here, there's a very careful distinction between what is private sector and what is civil society. Decision making takes place in plenary sessions rather than closed door drafting rooms, which is the norm in the UN system. And uh, so it's transparent. And at the end of the debate, it's the governments who decide and this, uh, uh, this is sometimes, um, suge it's sometimes suggested that this is a limitation of the CFS, that if you really want to empower civil society, they should be voting along with the governments. But in fact, it's civil society who wanted it to be this way. Because if it's not the governments who are deciding, they can't be held accountable. You, they can say, well, you know, what can we do about it? There were all of these funny people in the room. That was what was decided, but it's not our fault. So it's civil society which wanted the governments to be the decision makers and hence to be subject to be held to account for the decisions they make and for the impacts of these decisions. A very important part of the reform process was the recognition of civil society's right to self-organize rather than having the government say these organizations come, can come in the room and they have to be on, with these hats on their head. It's the civil society uh, autonomously designed the mechanism, the civil society mechanism, whereby they interface with the, uh, the CFS. And um, as you can see on this slide, the civil society mechanism gives pride of place to organizations that directly represent those most affected by food insecurity, peasants, artisanal fisher folk, pastoralists, indigenous peoples, etc., etc. NGOs are only one of 11 constituencies, and it's understood that it's the 10 other constituencies who really have the right to determine what the positions will be that civil society takes into the CFS. So, on paper, there has never been a global forum like this. So, to take a look and see what uh, difference it makes in practice, I'm going to focus on issues of land tenure and investment in agriculture, because these are two grouped issues that are at the heart of the contest between the two approaches to food provisioning that we looked at earlier, the corporate food regime, and the food sovereignty movement. And from the outset, civil society has been conducting a battle to obtain recognition that small-scale food producers and local food systems are the most modern, effective, and sustainable response to today's challenges and to win policy support for them in the CFS. How are they doing? 
When the phenomenon of land grabbing hit the headlines in 2008, you're all, of course, familiar with land grabbing. Yes. Um, there were essentially two opposing responses from the international community. On the one hand, the G8 asked the World Bank to uh, develop principles for responsible agricultural investment, uh, which are described here in this slide, which civil society viewed as being essentially a whitewash for land grabbing. Uh, because they welcome large-scale investments, including large-scale land acquisition, as an opportunity for economic development and the welfare of developing countries. They make no reference to human rights and state obligations. Corporations are expected to self-regulate. And there was no consultative process whatsoever behind them, not even with governments, let alone civil society. So that was one uh, solution that was proposed. And the other was, oh, I'm, I'm running into problems with Mac. You know, it's, it's the, when, when the, well, anyway, as long as it's, is it legible? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, the, the other solution that was proposed was to negotiate guidelines, politically negotiate in an intergovernmental forum, guidelines on the governance of tenure. And this was coming out of a decade of social movement advocacy. So the very first uh, session of the Reformed Committee on World Food Security uh, had these two very different proposals on the table. And uh, there was acrimonious debate up until 3 a.m. one evening, one morning, in which the civil society social movement interventions were determinate in obtaining from the committee that they agree to negotiate the tenure principles, guidelines. They refused to rubber stamp the World Bank Pry, although there was strong pressure from some G8 governments, particularly Canada, uh, US, Australia. And they decided instead to launch within the CFS a consultation on what kind of principles you would need to put in place if the objective was to ensure that investment in agriculture actually supports food security and the right to food. Oops, this is getting unreadable. Hmm. It's, it's because I, this is prepared on a... On a hmm. Well, let me just try to go through them in more detail. The, the, uh, the tenure guidelines were the subject of two years of intense negotiations. And of course, there, there were wins and losses as always. But these are the first ever global guidelines that have been adopted on the delicate issue of land tenure. They're based on um, principles of universal human rights. They're strong on a number of issues that are really important to social movements, like customary tenure, gender, community consultation, uh, priority to restitution and redistribution, states' obligations to regulate their corporations. And they do provide uh, safeguards against large-scale land acquisitions, even though they don't, as civil society would have liked, uh, totally condemn them. And these outcomes, all agree, would not have been possible in a less inclusive political forum. So let's see uh, what difference they make in the field. Uh, not surprisingly, the G8 and the corporations are paying lip service to the tenure guidelines while continuing to push for uh, opening up access to land for corporations through private sector friendly policy change and the new alliance for food security and nutrition that many of you or all of you may have heard of is an emblematic example of how this is being done. Indeed, policy changes, global policy gains have to be owned and used by the vulnerable to make a difference uh, in supporting their rights. And this is what the social movements are seeking to do by putting the tenure guidelines at the service 
of people's struggles in countries throughout the world and not only in the global south, as you can see from the Italian example in the corner of this slide. The fact that the social movements were so strongly engaged in developing and negotiating the tenure guidelines gives them a sense of ownership that makes all the difference as compared with other global instruments such as the Sustainable Development Goals or the Millennium Development Goals that were you know, floating up there in the stratosphere and that social movements never did anything with. So the examples that are evoked in these slides and many, many more are presented in a people's man manual on the tenure guidelines that's going to be published very shortly that has been prepared uh, by the movements themselves based on a collective process of popular education with consultations in all regions and they take concrete experience, concrete examples of people's struggles as the starting point to turn the dry text of the tenure guidelines into a living support for people's struggles. So the point for the social movements is not to implement the tenure guidelines, that's a, a, an institutional objective, but rather to use them as one element in their overall strategies to curb the powerful and defend the rights of the vulnerable. Of course, land grabbing is only the most visible aspect of a broader effort to orient investments in agriculture to promote corp the corporate food system backed up by very well-funded campaigns presenting it as a solution to food insecurity. I mentioned earlier the difference between land grabbing and uh, corporate value chains, pointing out that it, the corporate value chains can be even more inimical, well, or at least as inimical as, as land grabbing, to the resilience and the livelihoods of small-scale producers. So thanks in good part to social movement engagement, it has been possible to change the terms of the debate in the CFS. Uh, for example, it has been officially recognized in CFS uh, policy debates that it's the small-scale producers, not governments or corporations, who are responsible for most of the investment that takes place in agriculture. They're the big blue line in this FAO chart. Next you have the governments, then uh, public sector agricultural aid, etc., and the corporations are the smallest line. They're practically invisible. Um, and what's more, that investment is not just monetary. We have a tendency to equate investment with money, but most of the investment that takes place in agriculture has to do with labor and knowledge that's invested by small-scale producers on their land day by day. And these producers are also responsible for the food that meets the demand of most of the world's population. So it doesn't take two doctorates to understand that the only conceivable winning strategy to promote food security is to support and defend small-scale producers' own efforts, own investments. No? If you were a policymaker, would that not make sense to you? Um, yet, nonetheless, this logic continues, of course, to be contested by the proponents of the corporate food regime. But the fact that it is, as they say, uh, agreed language in the UN system is an important gain. Nobody can wash this out. It's been adopted, it's there, and it's uh, the subject also of an, this extremely important uh, report that I cited earlier that I think should be, uh, would be a good thing to put in the, in the library of this center if it's not there already, I'm sure it is. It was hoped that this policy guidance could be strengthened through the negotiation of the Responsible Agricultural Investment Principles of the CFS, the CFS uh, answer to the PRI that I mentioned earlier back in 2010. The CFS agreed that rather than adopting the PRI, rather than legitimizing the PRI, 
it would launch its own consultation to develop principles with the idea of food security and the right to food. And it was hoped that this more elaborate process would take the arguments of civil society a step further. Um, in the end, the Rye proved to be exceedingly strongly contested for several reasons. First of all, these principles, even more than just policy recommendations, are very well suited to being used by corporations and by private sector friendly bilateral and multilateral uh, aid programs to whitewash their operations by plucking out a couple of principles that are relatively innocuous and applying them to their operations saying, well, I'm respecting the Rye principles and then forgetting about the, the ones that have more political bite to them. So this is one reason why they fought harder. They fought very hard on the Rye. And the other is, in general, uh, in a sense, the fact that there was such a strong fight is a, an indicator of success of the CFS. The CFS, when it, when it was born in 2010, nobody thought it was very important. As the, the head of the, the uh, UN, the, uh, the EU delegation said to me, well, you know, when the CFS uh, saw the light, we thought it was a lame duck. And um, a year later, he said, well, it may not be a swan, but it's up and flying at least. Um, and and by, by, by last year, by 2012, the CFS had become uh, an important, an increasingly important policy forum. And hence the big powers were back in the room and they were fighting very hard to make sure that nothing slipped through that could be against their interests. So this, for, for these reasons, the, the, the negotiation was extremely, extremely strongly contested. The civil society uh, non-negotiable red lines, which are up here on this, uh, on this slide, were crossed on several occasions. And so the assessment was negative on some important points. Uh, it was felt that there was insufficient emphasis in the final product on the human rights framework, particularly regarding trade. Trade is allowed to trump the right to food. Um, and of course, this is going to be the, one of the hardest uh, battles to win. Uh, and uh, not sufficiently strong on public sector support for peasant-based production in food systems and access to resources. But at the same time, civil society has recognized that the very fact of having sidetracked the pry, where you will remember there was no mention whatsoever of state responsibilities, no mention whatsoever of human rights. So having sidetracked the pry, and upheld the primacy of political decision making and governmental accountability in this incredibly delicate issue, investment, was a victory in itself. So the CSM is monitoring the use that is being made, that will be made over the coming months of the Rye to see just how much cherry picking is going on and to what effect, and will use the results of this monitoring exercise both to mobilize at the country level and to carry the discussion in the CFS further. So the battle is never lost, it continues. Oops, okay. So whole, um, the CFS does make a difference with regard, at least in my assessment, and I think not mine alone, with regard to changing the terms of the debate, we've seen that, and to generating more progressive normative guidance that you get elsewhere. But there are big challenges. The CFS products are voluntary. They have to be picked up by governments and translated into national legislation to be binding. That's clear, isn't it? The WTO and the Security Council are the only parts of the global system that have binding uh, regulations and, uh, and and those of the CFS are not. And here we run up against the ambiguous role of states who are currently among the worst offenders in promoting narrow and short-sighted objectives. And yet, until we have something better out there, they're a basic building block for uh, accountability and for defense of citizens' collective uh, rights. <coughs> 
So holding governments to account requires certainly building stronger links between no global norms adoption and what really makes the difference, social and political mobilization from below. And this is a major challenge, I would say, I would say the major challenge for the CFS. Uh, of course, the uh, terms of engagement of social movements at the CFS can be improved considerably. And uh, Josh here at your center is doing a lot of work on that. And that's going to make uh, hopefully a big difference. <laughs> so where to next? We are getting very close to the absolute ecological, socioeconomic, and political limits of today's food system. The corporations are advocating ever more sophisticated and terrifying technological solutions. As you can see, we can forget about farmers altogether and just let the drones get on with the job. But um, there are alternatives, as we have seen. And I'd like to uh, close by taking a look at some of the key issues that need to be addressed in order to empower communities and regulate corporations, speculators, and markets. The apologists of the corporate food system try to ignore that there are issues of power. We instead have to recognize them, and we are in very good company, along with Olivier de Scooter and Jeffrey Sachs, for example. We need to insist on accountable governments rather than letting ourselves be seduced by what I call vaporous multi-stakeholderism that lets everyone into the room on the same footing without distinctions. So obviously the most powerful, in our case, the corporations rule the roost and government accountability evaporates. In national platforms, for example, should national actors only be in the room deciding what's best for their society? Or should there also be foreign donors, multilaterals, corporations? Would New Yorkers like to have the Chinese government sitting in the front row of the city council? After all, they own a hunk of New York. Why shouldn't they be there? Of course, obviously, they wouldn't. But that's exactly what happens in Bangladesh when it's a question of deciding whether the best way to promote better nutrition is through small-scale diversified agriculture and diets or corporation manufactured supplements. It's the funders and the investors who decide national policy through this multi-stakeholder platform. So there's a confusion of different actors and their roles and responsibilities, a blurring of decision-making and accountability and very serious policy imbalances. And even in the Committee on World Food Security, uh, although these distinctions are made and they're made clearly and this is fundamental, but there are questions to be asked. Should there be balance between corporate private sector and actors who represent those most affected by food security? As it is now, you have the civil society and the private sector mechanism and each one gets to speak five times, say, during a debate. Should there be balance, or do you have to weigh the voices according to what interests they represent? And if the corporations are in the room, is it not necessary to acknowledge and address potential conflicts of interest? And just to show that it's, I'm not being too radical, this is a, um, a very a very self-evident answer from a respectable source. Uh, it's evident that the commercial interests of multinational food companies inevitably diverge from those of public sector agencies. And when public officials downplay the divergence, they imperil the integrity of their institution. So what to do about this? That's an important question. A related issue is the need to debunk public-private partnerships. Have you all heard this word at least once a day in your, <laughs> in your daily work. It's certainly a buzzword these days. There is no sound evidence that they make a positive contribution to food security. On the contrary, and I deliberately put up in this slide 
the, the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Netherlands is, is known to be private sector friendly, and yet they too, when they undertake evidence-based research, um, are obliged to admit that the, the, the evidence isn't there. Um, and yet, recipient governments are enjoined to establish enabling environments for corporations, rather than for the small-scale producers who really are the actors of, of food security. And donor governments use our aid dollars, or pounds, as what is known as patient capital um, to cover up. Patient, what does patient capital do? It covers the upfront costs so that corporations can start to make profits right away without having to wait until these uh, uh, costs are, are paid off over time. And uh, PPPs most often fail to define the obligations and regulate the behavior of the private partners. And this brings us to the contested word regulation, which, however, uh, is a concept that seems to be gaining more favor even in the regulation allergic USA as a result of the financial meltdown and food safety issues. There's a lot of talk, of course, about um, corporate social responsibility, but research demonstrates that the uptake of corporate social responsibility, in fact, concerns a minimal part of corporate activities, mostly corporations that have well-known brand names like Coca-Cola, and so they care about their, their public image. But even these pick and choose which measures to apply at lowest cost and greatest visibility. Again, it's the cherry picking principle. This is um, one well-known example of a multi-stakeholder platform practicing corporate social responsibility, the round table on sustainable palm oil that you very likely may have heard of. I just would like you to take a look at the list of stakeholder groups who are around the table and suggest who is missing. Sorry? Well, the growers, in fact, are mostly, it, it doesn't show here on the slide, but the, the growers are mostly the big, big producers. Who else? Plantation workers. Exactly. Plantation workers who are being exploited and poisoned by pesticides. Who else? There are two other major, major groups. Actually, you say the, the producers, uh, the, pe the peasants who have kicked, been kicked off their land to make room for the plantations are missing. And there's one other major group that's not around the table, a major category. Governments? What'd you say? Governments. Governments. There are no governments, you know, so uh, who's deciding what and who's accountable for it? So. Transnational corporations' rights are protected by hard laws with strong tools for enforcement, but their obligations are backed only by soft laws. And this is no longer the strident voice of a small group of unreformed radicals. It's becoming common knowledge. So what do we do about it? And this is an open question. It's, no one has the answer yet. We're all looking for it. But I think certainly the international human rights framework is one good starting point for assigning political responsibility for corporate behavior. There, we have the, what's known as the Maastricht Principles, which were developed in 2012, which detail the obligations of states to ensure that businesses and corporations based in their territories respect human rights standards when they operate uh, abroad. And there's now, as some of you may know, since last June, the Human Rights Council in Geneva has taken on board the development of a treaty for binding obligations on TN, TNCs, on transnational corporations. And you can imagine the, the lineup of countries that voted against this. But just the fact that this dossier has been opened is already extremely important. So building accountable food governance from the bottom up can be done. Under pressure from citizens, national governments are daring to challenge global rules on issues like using public procurement 
and stocks, food stocks for food security. And in India, there's been this well-publicized case of uh, the India's battle with the WTO. Or raising tariffs to protect local poultry production from dumped frozen chicken parts in Senegal. And even in this epoch of globalized trade rules, national regulations can make the difference. This graph shows the, um, their effects on sales of imported milk formula in India, where they are importations are regulated, and breastfeeding is holding its own, and China, where, as you can see, the uh, imports of milk formula have, are, are leaping. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Uh, this means, of course, protecting citizen-led decision-making from further top-down abuses like the latest generation of bilateral trade and investment partnerships. I'm sure you've all heard of the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, TTIP, that's being negotiated behind closed doors, but in close consultation with the corporate li uh, lobbies. As you can see, 74% of all uh, meetings between DG Trade and external stakeholders have been with the corporate sector as opposed to, what is it, 12% with uh, public interest groups. And however, a massive citizens campaign in Europe is underway now, and I know it's big here in the UK, to turn a spotlight on these negotiations and may succeed in blocking them or at least taking off the table the uh, most damaging provisions. So it can happen. I started this talk by citing a wise and intransigent elderly statesman, Lord Boyd Orr. And now as I come towards the close, I'd like to quote another who actually resembles him. It's quite interesting. Law professor and human rights activist Richard Falk, who has raised essentially the same question that Lord Boyd Orr was addressing. What to do when what must be done for the sake of sustainability and survival exceeds what is politically possible? Uh, his answer involves two main elements. On the one hand, wresting legitimacy from those who are using discourse to uh, justify the neoliberal order and investing it instead in those who are, work, who are using discourse to promote equitable and sustainable alternatives. And the other element is promoting what he calls a robust dialectic between uh, functional uh, centralization to address global problems and a determined politics of decentralization and diffusion of power to where the citizens are and can weigh in. And that's a pretty good description of the agenda that the food sovereignty movement is pursuing. With what degree of success? Will the movement be able to help fragment the global domination of the corporate food system in favor of a territorially rooted and governed approach to food provision? Will the Reform Food uh, Committee on World Food S uh, Security fulfill its promise as a global forum that actually supports rather than squashing uh, initiatives from below? It sounds like turn in next week, tune in next week to the, <laughs> the next uh, uh, in the series. But these are open questions, of course. But I'd like to give the last word to West African peasant leader Mamadou Sissoko who has been uh, a companion in arms of mine over three decades of the experience that I've drawn on in writing this book. And the last time we were together, I asked him um, to what degree he felt hopeful about achieving the kind of change we've been fighting for. Uh, and he replied, you know, Nora, sometimes when we lose a battle, I think we should just give up, but it doesn't last long. I think about how far we've come and all that's moving today and I'd like to live for another 100 years. So I will leave you with this hopeful message and engagement to exchange because it's our food system and it'll take us all to change it for the better. <laughs>